Acts chapter 18, as we're continuing our study through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, and this week we're looking at chapter 18. Interesting chapter, and let me, I'm going to read it before we talk about it, but um, I just want you to notice all the, the comings and goings of, of God's servants. There's a lot of motion in this chapter, and you see that God is moving His chess pieces around the board. We're going to talk about God's plan for the gospel ministry. But just notice that as I read it. So Acts 18, this is the story of Paul's ministry in Corinth and his return back to his home church. It says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all of the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to, him, said to them, "'Your blood be on your own heads.'" I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler and his entire household, believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern, whatever. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centria, because of a vow he had taken. They arrived in Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they had asked him to spend more time with them, he declined. But as he left, he promised, I will come back if it is God's will. Then he set sail from Ephesus. And when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. And after some spending some time in Antioch, Paul went out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, The brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. And on arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Every church has a unique personality. That personality is made up by the people of the church and the history of the church and the social context of the church. And one of the fun things about being a pastor here at Sasha Baptist all these years is I've gotten to know the personality of this church so well, and in some ways I've contributed to it for good or for bad. Uh, but, you, you know, one of the, uh, the things I could say about South Shore churches, South Shore Baptist churches, there's, uh, there's a lot of type A people in this church. You know, a lot of go-getters here. It, it's, it's a fun place to be, and I am their leader. <laughs> I'm the same way. 
But, you know, type A people who are kind of driven and focused and they want to get things done and they see a problem and so they go, okay, well, let's make a plan. Let's marshal resources. Let's execute the plan. Accomplish, check, move on. And, and so there's that kind of uh, mentality. And it's great to be type A person. I love it myself and get a lot done. But, you know, there's some theological problems with being a, a planning, organizing type A type person. And one of them is that, you know, God has a plan. And sometimes his plan and my plan don't match. And you know who usually, okay, always wins that debate? God's plans do. And that can be frustrating when I have my plans and they're not God's plans. But if, if you learn to just accept it, and if you learn to submit your life to the sovereign will of God, it's actually very liberating, even as a type A driven person, just to say, you know, I, I'm going to do my best, make my plans, but at the end of the day, God is sovereign and God is in charge, and I'm going to trust the Lord and follow his plans. That's also true when it comes to this whole idea of gospel ministry. You know, this year at South Shore Baptist Church, uh, some of you may be new, new with us, we, we've been studying the book of Acts, and part of what we've been looking at in Acts is how, how we can be better as a church at engaging people with the gospel. We've been wanting to grow in our ability to, to share Christ and talk about the Lord and kind of push ourselves out of our comfort zones and, and be more engaged with the gospel in our community and everyone just kind of growing a little bit in that way. And, um, and so there's a lot you have to do, right? We, we've seen this in the book of Acts. We see Paul and he's opening his life and opening his mouth and opening his Bible and he's reaching out. And so Book of Acts is, is a great book to see the stuff that we have to do, our plans, our efforts. But we also have to remember that God has a plan for the gospel and that God's plan is also at work. And, and so, yeah, we have our responsibilities and our actions, but God has a plan as well. And, and sometimes his plan is different from our plans. And so one of the great truths of gospel ministry is that, wow, God is really executing a plan. And when it comes to being someone who tells people about Jesus, I'm kind of along for the ride. It's his plan. He's the one doing it, and I just have to be faithful to what he's given me. So here in Acts 18, it's a cool chapter because at one level, we see the human activity and the human planning of being faithful in engaging people with the gospel. But Acts 18 also kind of opens up the curtain. It, it lets us see this, this other level of God's plans in the world and how those two fit together. So let's, let's look at this. And here's two, two truths I want us to see in this passage today about God's plans for the gospel. The first one is this, number one, that God has a plan to save specific people through the gospel. God has a plan to save specific people through the gospel. God has people he is going to rescue and deliver, and that's his plan. You see it there at the beginning of chapter 18. So we just pick up the story. Here's Paul. He arrives in Corinth. Corinth is in southern Greece. If you want to, you look in your bulletins. In your bulletins on the inside front cover, you'll see this little map that we've had in there for a couple weeks now. And you can see where Corinth is. It's down at the southern tip of Greece. So Paul's been making his way through Greece, and now he comes to Corinth, major cosmopolitan city, major uh, trade crossroads city, and uh, he starts preaching the gospel there. And, and in some ways, what Paul does in Corinth is kind of business as usual. He shows up, he starts working, making tents, he's got to support himself financially, he goes to the synagogue as usual. He tells the Jewish people in the synagogue that Jesus is the Christ as usual. And once he's telling them about Jesus, there's different responses as usual. Some people are believing the gospel and some people are opposed to it. You see it there. You know, some people are really opposed. It says that uh, verse 6, some of the Jews there became abusive. And Paul had to kind of like have this big fight with them where he shook out his clothes, this Old Testament gesture of, of shaking someone off and saying, I'm done here. I'm going to go preach to the Gentiles. And yet other people believed. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, believes. So even though a lot of the people in the synagogue don't want him there, the ruler becomes a Christian. So it's mixed responses. And so, so far, so good. Everything Paul is doing in Corinth looks like everything he did in Athens, looks like everything he did in Thessalonica. It's his pattern. He does the same plan. He shows up, goes to the synagogue, he preaches the gospel. Some people believe, some people don't. And then you get verses 9 to 11 which are really cool, because here the heavens open up 
Paul has a vision, and he gets a little glimpse at God's plan for Corinth, right? Don't you sometimes wish you knew what God's plan was? Like, God, just, what's the plan? What do you want me to do? Please just tell me. This is one of those times where God says, I'm going to tell you the plan. This is, this is what I'm doing in Corinth, and here it is. So now we see God's plan, that, that heavenly level. So Paul's been executing the plan from the human level, show up, preach the gospel, be faithful, expect different mixed results. But now God says, now I'm going to show you what I'm planning here. And so let's, let's break it down, what he says in verses 9 to 11. One night the Lord, that is Jesus, Jesus is the Lord in the book of Acts. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. I'm with you. No one's going to attack you and harm you. Now, why does, why does Jesus have to tell Paul this? Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. No one's going to hurt you. It's probably because every other place he's preached at in Greece, people have heard him. <laughs> like, this is his normal experience. I show up. I go to the synagogue. I preach the gospel. Some people believe. Some people don't. And then the people who don't, Arrest me, beat me, run me out of town, stone me, right? So you can almost see Paul here. He shows up in Corinth, starts preaching the gospel. Some people believe, some people don't. Some people are getting agitated, and he's like, I wonder what's going to happen this time. I wonder if they're going to beat me with sticks. Are you like, oh, you know? Could you see him just bracing for impact, shields up? And Jesus shows up in a dream and says, hey, don't worry. No one's going to hurt you in Corinth. You're safe this time. Really? Just keep speaking. Don't worry. Don't brace for impact. Keep speaking. No one's going to harm you here. I think that's the whole point of verses um, 12 through 17, that whole weird story about Paul in front of Gallio, the, the proconsul. The whole point of that is it shows that Jesus' words came true. He, he went to trial, and he kind of escaped, and something happened, and he was fine. He was able to stay in Corinth a long time and keep preaching. You say, well, why is it that that sometimes Paul got beaten and run out of town and had to sneak out in the middle of the night so he didn't get killed. And other times, now in Corinth, Paul could just keep on preaching for a year and a half. And it's, well, that's the plan of God. You know, why what, what does what some person called to ministry and they seem like they suffer and they're just, you know, pushing the, the stone up the hill and they never can get anywhere and then they're beaten and they're martyred and some Christians have it so hard and other Christians, it seems like, you know, they, they just... They start a church and it explodes and lots of people come and they have a very successful ministry from the world's perspective. You know, why are there different paths and different patterns? And again, this is the plan of God. He's sovereign. And, and he calls us to different ministries and to different times. And sometimes it's a season of blessing like this. And sometimes it's a season of suffering. But God is, is in charge. So why is it now that Paul's going to be safe and protected? Well, it's this line here in verse 10. It's an amazing little line. He says, you know it's going to hurt you. Keep talking. Why? Because I have many people in this city. So there's the secret plan of God that we can't normally know, but God speaks and he says, listen, you're going to be safe here because there's more people of mine that I want you to share the gospel with so that they'll be saved. I have more people in the city. Keep evangelizing. You haven't found them all yet. Keep going. And so really, we, we, we sort of stumbled across here this interesting doctrine that keeps popping up different places in the Scripture. Sometimes we call it the doctrine of predestination or election, uh, even though that term is not used here. But it's this idea that, that God has chosen some people, that God has people that he's planning to save, that God has predestined some to be saved, and, which is a really challenging idea to get your head around. I, I fully don't understand it myself, but it's all over the Bible, especially the New Testament. It's a very clear pattern. And, and so, yeah, keep preaching, believe the gospel, but God has a plan, and God says, I've got people there that you're going to find that are going to be saved by you preaching. I have more people in the city. Keep speaking. This is a theme we've already seen in the book of Acts. Go back to Acts chapter 13, for instance. Acts chapter 13, verse 47 so in Acts chapter 13, Paul was uh, in another city called City in Antioch, and he was preaching, and he has the same kind of mixed response. It's deja vu all over again. And Paul finally says, fine, I'm going to start preaching to the Gentiles now. If you and my Jewish brothers and sisters aren't going to listen, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. And uh, look at verse 48 of chapter 13. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of God 
and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. So who believes? Those whom God has already appointed to eternal life. Or you see it in chapter 15. If you go to chapter 15 of Acts, this is at Jerusalem Council. You've got a mostly Jewish church at this point, and all these Gentiles are getting saved, and so the Jewish church meets and says, what should we do about that? And their answer is, man, we should just be happy that God is saving these Gentiles and welcome them in. And it's at that point that James, in verse 13, kind of the head of the church at that point, he, he speaks up and he says, brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by, get this, taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. God is actively taking a people. God has a plan to save specific people. God is saving. Not, it's not just kind of a generic plan for humanity, but it's a plan that, that involves specific names of people that he's gathering for himself, those appointed for eternal life. Or even look at the end of chapter 18. Just one more example. Go back to our chapter we're on. So at the end of it, we get to Apollos, who we're going to see. Apollos is going to replace Paul in Corinth and pick up the ministry where Paul leaves off there. But Apollos gets to Corinth, and look what it says at the end of verse 27. On arriving, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. So the Christians in in Corinth are those who by grace had believed. In other words, we believe by grace. We're not just saved by grace. We believe by grace. So, you know, we're, we're saved by faith in Jesus, but even the believing, even that moment where you decided to follow Christ and you put your faith in Jesus, which you did, yes, you did, that was a gift of grace. We believe by grace, too. And so God has, has chosen people, and he's saving them, and he's using gospel ministry to do it. And again, this is a huge issue and super complex, and people have talked about this for two millennia in the church and have not figured it out, so I don't intend to solve it all right now either, even if I could. If I could, I'd write a book and make a million bucks. But, uh, but notice this here, that, that Jesus seems to be using the fact that he has people to save as a motivation for evangelism. Often when we think about Jesus, God's predestining some to be saved, and we think about evangelism, we see those as opposites. Like if you believe in predestination, it's going to kind of let the air out of the tires of evangelism, you know? Like, well, why should I go tell anyone about Jesus? God's already gone. Save is going to save. I'm just going to sit here and watch TV. God will do whatever he's going to do. It doesn't matter what I do. Why should I talk to anyone? You know, and, it, and we think it's like a demotivation for evangelism. But that's not how Jesus frames it here. Jesus says, I want you to keep talking, keep speaking, keep preaching. Don't be silent. Why? Because there are people there to be found. Because I've chosen them. And you're the means by which it's going to happen. So he sees it the opposite. It's a motivation for evangelism and outreach. Because God has a plan, you should be excited about evangelism because there's people out there to find. And this really changes the way we think about evangelism. I think a lot of times we, we don't do evangelism as Christians because we just have a wrong view of it, in part. We think of it as like telemarketing. You know, or, you know telemarketers, they call you and you're like, I'm trying to eat dinner here. You know, we're yelling at this person. You know, I thought, the other thing about the person on the other end of the line, like they're probably a telemarketer because they're just trying to make some money. You know, they're just trying to make a buck. It's a tough job. And, and, and you know, they don't enjoy I'm sure they're not like, boy, when I'm going to grow up, I want to be a telemarketer. I'm sure they're like, you know, they're just trying to put some money together and, and earn a living for now. And, and so we think of that as Christians sometimes. Like, oh, I'm, you know, evangelism is telemarketing. Gotta, first of all, I've got to get the conversation going. I don't want them to hang up on me. So I got to like make sure I, I kind of pull them in and woo them in. And then, then I got to, if they have an objection, I got to answer that. And, you know, maybe like one out of every thousand conversations, I'll actually tell someone about Jesus, right? And, you know, if that's what evangelism is, yeah, not interested. <laughs> I'm not interested. Are you? Does that sound fun? I mean, it's like, no, that sounds really hard. But when we realize that God has a sovereign plan, that God has already appointed people to eternal life, that, that he has people in the city already, then evangelism isn't like telemarketing where we're trying to twist people's arms. It's actually like, um, this is the analogy I came up with, it may be lame, but it's like an Easter egg hunt, you know? I don't know if any kids here, you guys do an Easter egg hunt this year, you know, anyone, anyone do that? Kids love Easter egg hunts. Any kids here don't like Easter egg hunts? Raise your hand if you're a kid who hates Easter egg hunts. I, I love Easter egg hunts, right? 
I mean, just the thought that people hid candy in the woods is amazing. That's brilliant. But, but, you, but you know, you, it's like you give the kids the, the eggs, you know, the baskets. You're like, go find the eggs. And they're like, ah, and they're looking around. When has a kid ever said, wait, 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 wait a minute. You already hid the eggs? You already know how many there are and where they're hidden? Well, I'm not going to go look for the eggs. You, you, you go find them yourself, Mom and Dad. This thing is a whole setup, you know? It's already determined. I'm not going to go look for the eggs. Of course you don't. You're like, yay, there's eggs with chocolate inside. Woo! And, and there's a certain liberation and freedom in that, that, that God, is, God is, I have people there. Go find them. Go, go be a part of this amazing thing I'm doing. Share with me in the joy of finding the people for whom I've died. Be a partner with me in my, my saving work. And so there's great joy. And, and when you start seeing that our efforts and our work and all of our type A efforts to be better evangelists and all that and beat ourselves to do better, that really God has a plan and we're just kind of jumping in with what he's doing it's super liberating and super, it makes it fun. It makes it exciting. Like, I don't know how God is going to use. Because you know what it means? It means, number one, we can never write anybody off. I never know if I'm talking to someone, whether or not that's someone God is planning to save. Isn't it fun? I, I never, I can't be like, well, he's not going to save that guy. That guy, he's a total jerk. <laughs> don't know. He could. God saves jerks. All right? Case in point. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You know, oh, God wants to save that guy. That, that guy, he's hostile. No. You know, that, that person's a, you know, they're kind of a loser. Oh, that guy, he just serves me my coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. You never know. You can't write anybody off. And you can't give up on anyone because you don't know if, if at some point God is going to do that work of grace and give someone grace to believe. Just because you tell someone about Jesus and they don't fall on their knees right there and repent and believe doesn't mean that God hasn't chosen them. Because God can give grace whenever God wants to give grace. He's not only sovereign in who, but he's also sovereign in the when. And so our job is just to keep, keep at it, keep faithful. You never know when the Easter egg will be found. It's an, it's an amazing thing to see what God is doing. You know what else it means? It means it's possible that God is looking for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus. You, you wouldn't say, I'm a Christian yet. And then you hear about things like predestination, and you're like, what? Well, what if I'm not predestined? What if you are? What if you are? Maybe that's why you're here. Maybe, maybe that's why you, you keep having these pullings and these longings and weird coincidences in your life where you find yourself. It, you know, maybe that's why you, you, you have this nagging wondering in your soul, even as, as hard as you try to fend off questions of faith, maybe there's something working in your heart, a curiosity. Could it be because God is coming for you? You know? And ultimately, we don't know. The only thing you can do is have faith and repent and believe in Jesus. That's the call. And so knowing that God has a plan is really exciting. That plan involves a plan to save specific people people with names, not just kind of a generic salvation thrown to the wind, but specific people like Titius Justice and Crispus, specific individuals God is saving. But not only is God sovereign, here's the second great truth of Acts 18, not only is God's sovereign and plan involve a plan to save specific people, but it's also a plan to send specific people. God has not only or- orchestrated that some would be saved, but God is also orchestrating people to go bring them the gospel. That's the other thing we see in Acts chapter 18. It's a, it's a chapter on the move. There are a lot of people, a lot of people names, a lot of place names. This is the chapter that if someone asks you to read it out loud in your Bible study group, you wince because there's so many weird place names. You're like, oh man, I'm going to pronounce all this stuff wrong. What? Phrygia? Fright? How do you say that? You know, because it, people are on the move. God is moving everybody around. This is one of those chapters where we get a glimpse of God as grandmaster chess player, where God is moving the rook here, and then he's moving the bishop there, and then you're like, you know, like, God, why would you put the bishop there and the rook there? And God's like, don't worry, it's five moves till checkmate. What do you mean it's five moves till checkmate? No way. Watch this. Boop, 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 boop. See? 
God knows what he's doing. He, he's like a general who sees the whole battle. We're just in our own little war here. We're just caught up in our own little lives and our own little struggles. And God sees the whole battle map. And he's like, we're going to retreat there. We're going to retreat here. God, that's not a good plan. Retreat. And if we could see the whole battle plan, we'd know that he's moving this person there and that person there. And that's what God does. Look at this chapter. It's, just, it's full of God's sovereign moving of people. And, and it's just wonderful how, how different people go different places, and it's all, it all kind of works out in God's plan. Uh, four examples. Example number one, Paul himself, a man on the move, always going from place to place, knowing that God is leading him. He's there in Corinth for as long as Jesus has in there, a year and a half, and then he leaves, and he ends up in Ephesus. I love it. In uh, verse 20, they want him to stay in Ephesus. So he gets to Ephesus, and people are like, whoa, Paul please stay. You need to minister here. This is a great place. He says, I got to go. Verse 21, I will come back and then look at these words, if it is God's will. If you're a type A person, you need to memorize those five words, if it is God's will. And you need to begin incorporating them in your vocabulary. Then I'm going to do this and that and that. Mm, If it is God's will. (laughs) We need to remember that God's will is sovereign. I have a pastor friend named Mark. Mark is super type A. Like he is like managing, you know, it's like God loves you and Mark has a wonderful plan for your life. And uh, he's managing everyone's life and moving everybody around. But one of the phrases he always says that I love is he always says, Lord willing. You say, hey, hey Mark, hopefully, you know, I'm going to see you next year. And he'll say, Lord willing. It's, just, it's a great little phrase he always says. And you know, that's, after a while, you say, oh, he says that a lot. Why does he say that? Yeah, it is Lord willing. It's whatever God wills. It tells us in the book of James that we should not say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, but that we should say, if it's the Lord's will, I'll do this and that. And so Paul realized that even his, his ministry movements were under this sovereign plan of God, that God moves us here and there. And that's liberating to embrace that. We see the ministry movement in Secondly, not only Paul, but also Timothy and Silas in verse 5 of chapter 18. Timothy and Silas arrive, and so there's different workers moving around. One of the things I love about Paul is that he never ministers alone. He's always in a team. Paul's not the lone ranger going out to save the world for Jesus. He's always a part of teams. He's working, raising up workers. He's always got people around him. And as we think about becoming a church that's more engaged in pr- proclaiming the gospel on the South Shore... That's not just an individual call. It's something we all do together, and we encourage each other in. It's, it's a team effort. Evangelism is a team thing that we do. Um, just like Paul always had teams around him, and he moved, and moved people around. I uh, was talking to Godwin this week, Pastor Godwin, and he was uh, telling me about something he does sometimes in his uh, growth group Bible study. Now, some of you are in that Bible study with him, but apparently one of the things they, they've tried to do sometimes is go around the circle and just ask people in the Bible study, who are you ministering to? Who have you been trying to share the gospel with? Who have you been trying to read the Bible one-on-one with? And, and just try to get that, that mutual accountability. Not, not that it's like a scorecard, like, you know, oh, you failed this week or something. But that, hey, we're a team, and we're working together to encourage each other, not just to come to a Bible study and get some feeding for ourselves, but then to sort of encourage and equip each other to be more engaged with the world for the sake of the gospel as people come and go. And so there's kind of an awareness that, that we can develop of movement as God sends us different places and takes us different places. So there's Paul, and there's Paul, and then there's Timothy and Silas. Number three, there's Priscilla and Aquila. You've got to love them. They just happen to be in Corinth, and Paul meets them, and they become best friends. One of the things you know from the rest of the Bible is that Priscilla and Aquila become two of Paul's best friends and ministry buddies. He loves them, and he meets them here in Corinth for the first time. They just happen to both be tent makers. Now, interestingly, why are Priscilla and Aquila in Corinth? Well, because look at verse 3, no, verse 2. Claudius, that's the emperor of Rome, had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. So in 49 AD, uh, the emperor Claudius expelled all the Jewish people from Rome. And it's interesting, from the history books, the reason Claudius expelled them from Rome, according to the history books, is because of an incident involving someone named Crestus. And so historians are like, who's Crestus? And, and there's, you know, one of the, the theories that a lot of historians have is that Crestus is Christ. And that what happened was the gospel came to Rome, 
And then just like the gospel tended to do, there's a big hubbub with some Jewish people becoming followers of Christ and some not, and a big disturbance in Rome. And, and then the emperor you know, of Rome sitting there you know, eating his grapes, being fanned. It's like, you know, what is this Christus? All the Jews be gone. And he, he kicked them out of Rome. And so Priscilla and Aquila left. You could imagine Priscilla and Aquila. You could imagine if you were kicked out of a place. You would say, this isn't fair. This isn't just. Why am I in Corinth? I had a good business going in Rome. God, what are you doing? What is your plan for my life? And they're sitting there in Corinth. You know, what is God's plan? Making tents. And next thing you know, there's Paul. And God had aligned their paths. And they become key workers for Paul. And then Paul, when he leaves Corinth, he takes Priscilla and Aquila with him. And they get to Ephesus. And Paul deposits Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. And then he keeps going. Right? And then who comes to Ephesus? Character number four. Apollos. He comes from Alexandria. And he's a super well-educated Jewish fellow who, who knows Jesus and he's doing a really good job arguing for Jesus and he comes to Ephesus and Priscilla and Aquila are like, where did this guy come from? He's really, he's hot stuff, wow. Eh, he, he needs a little bit of fixing. Well, let's pull him aside and they tune up his theology a little bit and then they send him out and then where does he end up? Apollo ends up going to Corinth. That's where Achaia is. So the story, chapter 18, begins with Paul in Corinth arguing that Jesus is the Christ, and it ends with Apollos in Corinth, as it says in verse 28, arguing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so there's a nice symmetry to the whole chapter, but the point is the gospel is moving forward, and God has a plan, and it involves moving people all over the place like a grandmaster chess player. It's really exciting. And this is what God does. You know, when you surrender your heart to God and your life to God and you say, Lord, use me, send me, here am I, he does that. And and we go, we we end up places we never would imagine. And it seems crazy and chaotic. It it doesn't look like how type A people would plan things. It would be a lot more organized the way we did it, you know. But when God does it, it's this crazy organic web of people moving places. But he's he's orchestrating this whole thing. Um, it, just a, a story from here in our own church, and I've shared this once before, but many of you know Blaine Boyd. He's one of our uh, pastoral interns here. He's going to Dubai this, uh, Lord willing, uh, September in the United Arab Emirates, and he's going there to plant a church in the UAE. It's, it's you know, really exciting, and uh, maybe in the UAE, maybe somewhere in the Gulf region. And, and sometimes people have asked me, like, how did Blaine get to Dubai? Like, how did that happen? And I'm like, well, let me tell you the story, you <laughs> know. It didn't start with Blaine. It started with a guy named Dave, who was an intern who came to faith in Jesus here. And Dave went to seminary. And in Dave's first week at seminary, he met Blaine. And they hit it off. And they have this kind of really weird, like, Frodo and Sam relationship. And, uh, and so, so, you know, Dave brought Blaine back to South Shore Baptist. He's like, this is Blaine. And so we got to know Blaine. And then as Blaine was here, becoming one of our pastoral interns, someone came from Dubai named Max Stiles, who was a missionary speaker here. And we all met Mac, and we went out to Dunkin' Donuts with Mac, and we all talked about ministry. And then Mac said, you guys should come to Dubai and do some ministry there. So Godwin and Pastor Godwin and Blaine and I, we went to Dubai last year, and we met them there. And then in Dubai, they all met Blaine and said, hmm, Blaine, interesting. And so then that started, and then one thing led to another. And so that's how it happens. It's like, it's not because we sat down and had this awesome master plan for getting Blaine to Dubai. God just moved and God opens doors and God builds relationships and networks. And so often this is how, how it happens as God puts things on people's hearts and he moves and shifts us around. And so that means we have to be willing to move and go. That moving might be going to some faraway country. That moving might just be for some of us getting up and knocking next door to the person next door who we've lived next to for like 15 years but never talked to. Not that that ever happens. But, you know, like, hi, I'm your neighbor. You know, it it just, it could mean just going to that loser kid at the next lunch table that no one ever sits with and engaging that person and befriending people. You know, when you surrender yourself to the gospel, we move and people move and that's okay because it's the gospel work. God moves us around. Some of us don't like that. Some of us don't like change. We like things just to be the way they are. I want my church to be this way, and I want certain people to be this way, and my Bible study is always going to be these people, and everything's going to be a certain way, and that's not life. Life is always change, and especially the life of following the Lord in gospel ministry. There's movement, and we have to be okay to let people go and be okay to go ourselves as God moves. 
Because here's the thing. Someday we're all going to be together in heaven, right? And you know, how long are we going to be together in heaven? Forever. <laughs> so so the, the time of moving and, and transience is like now, and it lasts 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, maybe 80 years, maybe like 90 years if you got really good genes, whatever. But, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's a puff. It's, a, it's lint. It, it's fog. It's just, and your life is over. And then there's eternity. And, and so, like, what, what are we holding on to? We, we, we need to be willing to just say, Lord, use me, send me, whatever. And then, then you know, whatever he says. Lord, I'm willing to go to Dubai. Great, I want you to stay in Hanover. What? You know, who knows? God, it, the point is, it's in his hands. And we surrender our lives to him. And we say, Lord, send me. And, then, and God uses us as he uses us. You know another thing about our church, and, and I'm, I'm pointing my fingers at myself here too. You know another thing I would say about our church and our personality as a church is I think our church is too conservative. And I don't mean that theologically. Let's always be conservative theologically, please. <laughs> what God's word says is what God's word says. What I mean is, is like this. I just think we're too risk averse as a church. And maybe that's our church. Maybe that's just life in suburbia. I don't know. But I just think we're just so comfortable like with our lives a certain way and doing certain things and our patterns. And, and we just, you know, we're so close to the possibility that God may have something for us next door or in, in the next cubicle or down the hall and someone that he wants us to minister to. And, and we're just so, it's, it's like we're so concerned about just making sure our life works out and is, is fixed the right way. This, this thing we're holding on to that's, you know, 40 years in the light of eternity. What are we holding on to so tightly for? And I think we need, as a church, and I need to be willing to let go and to see where the Lord would lead and what he would do. And we need to be open to the Spirit's leading as God would put things on our hearts to do things. I don't know, has God put something on your heart? Has he poked and prodded you to do something and you've kind of batted away like, oh, that's crazy. I don't even know why I thought that. That's just silly. You know, that's not practical. That, that's, that would cost money. I can't do that. Like, why are you batting that away? What if God is prodding you and leading you? Or not? Who knows? But are you open? That's the question of what the Lord would have you do in your life. Ultimately, it's a call to be like Jesus. Jesus, who is the missionary par excellence. Jesus, who left heaven's glory and laid aside his glory, and he came to earth. And Jesus, who poured out his life on the cross for our salvation. Jesus, who poured out his life so that we could be saved. And he calls us to go and to be his missionaries and be his ambassadors. And so may the Lord help us to let go a little bit, trust his plan, to be excited about evangelism, to know that, that there are people out there and that he could use us too as we trust him in his plan. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the sovereign God, that you have a plan for saving the nations. Thank you, Lord, that you have chosen to save specific people. Lord, you will, you will find and rescue all for whom you died. And Lord, we also thank you that you, you use us. That's so amazing that we would be the conduits through which that saving power flows. And so, God, we surrender our lives to you. We say, Lord, use us. Lord, mold us. God, we give you our time, our talents, our treasures. Lord, help us to, to be open to going far away, but help us also just be open to talking to the person next door and being used as your evangelist right here. So, Lord, use us. Give us the right heart, we pray. And may our church just be engaged fully in your gospel work until you return. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.